Welcome to the Ethics and Technology Lecture, where we take a step back from the previous topics we've been going through. So last time, you know, we've gone through computer history and those kind of models of people thinking, and we've then concentrated on like looking at the spectrum of technological determinism and social construction of technology. So which impacts on who controls the change in society and the change in actual technology from there. So what's next? Well, step into a new topic and start talking about ethics and technology. And so this lecture here will specifically, like, again, ethics can't be summed up in this quick lectures that I've done here. But what I want to begin is this dialogue of talking about ethics and technology between here. Like, what is ethics and the definition that I'm giving to it? What are some lenses that you could potentially look through? And what are some kind of question points when it comes up when we think about ethical considerations and then the technology that we are actually using or creating today? So uh, I peppered throughout these slides here, at least in the beginning, a few introductory like videos that I thought would be a nice way to give you like someone else's perspective, giving an introduction on ethics and society. How many decisions do you think you make each day? If you ask the internet, the answer will range from 70 to 35,000. If you ask us, it's the wrong question to be asking at all. That's because we're interested in ethics. We're not concerned about the quantity of your decisions. We care about their quality. You might want to think of ethics as a tool that helps us create the difference between a good decision and a bad one. Ethics is the branch of philosophy that asks the practical question, what should we do? This leads to the study of things like values, principles, beliefs, and norms. These are the things that shape our choices. Ethics asks us, how should we live? What choices should we make? And what makes our lives worth living? It tries to help us define the conditions of a good choice and then figure out which of our available options is the best one. Let's say a close friend, Lee, confides in you that they're struggling with depression. They're feeling isolated and alone, but whenever they're invited to go out, they find it impossible to do. Lee insists they don't want anyone else to know. They're trusting this information to you alone. A few days later, another friend comes to you frustrated about Lee. Lee's flaked on plans at the last minute yet again, and your friend has had enough. They've decided they just won't bother inviting Lee out anymore. So you're torn. If Lee stops being invited to things, the isolation could make them feel even worse. Sharing information about their depression might help Lee be treated with more empathy and compassion. But it would be a breach of trust. And if Lee found out, especially in a vulnerable state, who knows what might happen? What do you do? Keep the secret and allow Lee to be socially isolated? Or break Lee's trust, but do it for their benefit? Answering this question means getting clear on what matters, our values and principles. Our values are the things we hold to be good and therefore care about most deeply. Things like justice, knowledge, family and equality. In this case, we're likely to value both trustworthiness and compassion which pull us in different directions. So it looks like an appeal to values alone won't let us solve this dilemma. We don't just need to know what's good, we need to know what's right. This is where principles come in. They help us draw a line in the sand. They determine the acceptable ways of getting the things that we value. So what's our guiding principle with regard to Lee? Some people might adopt a principle like, be true to your word, meaning you keep Lee's confidence no matter the risks. Others might be inclined towards a principle like act in people's best interests and decide that it's in Lee's best interest that people know about the depression. Of course, there are still ambiguities, which is part of what makes ethical decision-making so complicated. 
So how do we select which values and principles to adopt? And how do we make choices when we face a conflict of values and principles? Good versus good, right versus right. What helps to orient our judgment is a connection to purpose. What's our guiding North Star? What's our reason for being? Think about Lee again. Now, think about the purpose of friendship. What are friends for? Think about why Lee decided to tell you in confidence. Your purpose as Lee's friend is to share their life with them, the highs and the lows. But it's their life and it's their decision on who they share it with. Lee chose to share this information with you alone. Given this, even if you prefer to act in people's best interests, thinking about purpose and thinking about Lee's purpose might encourage you to take a different path. Every time we make a choice, we change the world. What kind of world do you want to live in? Whether you make 35,000 choices a day or just one, what's important is that you make choices that are good and right. Choices you can justify, ones you can be proud of. That's what makes the choices actively yours. So I hope that gave you a nice beginning introduction to the idea of ethics, that it is kind of like a complex scenario of what you need to analyze between like your beliefs, your connections, and what you've actually learned. And so I, in this course, I'm not telling you how to be ethical. I'm not telling you how to think. I'm just presenting you with some different facts that you can then incorporate into your data, information, knowledge, web that you actually have and see interacting. Maybe pull you away from what is from, say, your technical and other courses and getting you to spend some time thinking about these topics. And so here, as a definition for me to give to build upon what was said in that video is what is ethics? Like ethics is based on well-founded standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do, usually in terms of rights, obligations, benefits to society, fairness, or specific virtues. And you can see even starting with that definition, it's not a simple quick answer of, well, what are those obligations? What are those benefits? What is considered to be right and wrong from right here, but that guiding point for it. And right now, what I would like you to do is think and even pause the video if you're at this time and think about like, what does ethics mean to you? And just think about that for a second. Like what, when you think about the word ethics, what are you associating with it first? Like, where did you learn ethics from? What are your ethics? Uh, are you uh, only in one form that never changes? And so think about that. So I pause the video for a little bit and come back when you're ready and continue on. Now, other examples I pull from other material is that some years ago, a sociologist asked business people, what does ethics mean to you? And among the replies were things like the following. Uh, ethics has to do with what my feelings tell me is right or wrong. Ethics has to do with my religious beliefs. Being ethical is doing what the law requires. Ethical con ethics consists of the standards of behavior society accepts. Um, I don't know what the word means. These replies might be typical of our own, and the meaning of ethics is hard to pin down, and the views many people have about ethics are shaky. And like the first respondent, uh, you can see from that last time here, ethics has to do with my feelings, tell me is right or wrong is that many people tend to equate ethics with their feelings, but being ethical is clearly not a matter of following one's feelings. A person following their feelings may recoil from doing what is right. In fact, feelings frequently deviate from what is ethical. Nor should one identify ethics with religion. Most religions, of course, advocate high ethical standards, yet if ethics were confined to religion, then ethics would apply only to religious people but ethics applies as much to the behavior of the atheist as to that of the devout religious person. So religion can set a high ethical standards and can provide intense 
uh, motivations for ethical behavior. But ethics, however, cannot be confined to religion, nor is it the same as religion. So this is not saying, hey, throw out everything from religion. This is saying that, yes, like from religions do provide these ethical backgrounds that become incorporated into some people's lives. But it, ethics isn't only equated with just religion at all. And between different religions is the same ethics held between different forms of religion. What the hell? That ethics is larger than this. And religion does play a role in this and should be something that people can evaluate for themselves, what gives them that guiding kind of light. But it shouldn't be the only place to start searching for ethics. So being ethical is also not the same as following the law. The law often incorporates ethical standards to which most citizens subscribe, but laws like feelings can deviate from what is ethical. Our own slavery laws and the old apartheid laws of present day South Africa are uh, grotesquely obvious examples of laws that deviated from what was ethical and that there were other things that were playing the role here. So just purely following the laws. And finally, being ethical is not the same as being whatever society accepts. In any society, most people accept standards that are, in fact, ethical, but standards of behavior in society can deviate from what is ethical. An entire society can become ethically corrupt. So Nazi Germany is a good example of a morally corrupt society. Moreover, if being ethical were doing whatever society accepts, then to find out what is ethical, one would have to find out what society accepts. To decide what I should think about abortion, for example, I would have to take a survey of society and then conform my beliefs to whatever society accepts. But no one ever tries to decide an ethical issue by doing a survey. Further, the lack of social consequences on many issues make it impossible to equate ethics with whatever society accepts. Some people accept abortion, but many others do not. If being ethical were doing whatever society accepts, one would have to find an agreement on issues which does not exist, does not in fact actually exist. What then is ethics? Ethics is two things. And so coming from this, you can take this, there's a whole range of like education courses and everything else that you can look into and arguments about this, but I'm just presenting two as a beginning point for this, is that ethics first, it refers to well-founded standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do, usually in terms of rights, obligation, benefits to society, fairness, or specific virtues. And so ethics, for example, refers to those standards that impose the reasonable obligations to refrain from rape, stealing, murder, assault, slander, fraud. Ethical standards also include those that enjoin virtues of honesty, compassion, and loyalty. And ethical standards include standards relating to rights such as the rights to life, the right to freedom from injury, and the right to privacy. Such so standards are adequate standards of ethics because they are supported by a consistent and well-founded reasons. Secondly, ethics refers to the study and development of one's ethical standards. As mentioned before, feelings, laws, and social norms can deviate from what is ethical, so it is necessary to constantly examine one's standards to ensure that they are reasonable and well-founded and that we grow and change as we have this new knowledge. Ethics also means then the continuous effort of studying our own moral beliefs and our moral conduct and striving to ensure that we and the institutions we help to shape live up to the standards and uh, standards that are reasonable and solidly based. And so this is where we're all changing, being a complex kind of ethics of saying like, there's only one way to live ethically. And well, from person to person, this is going to actually shift. But the idea is just saying that the way I'm doing is the only ethical way of doing it and not trying to grow and reevaluate ourselves as we're introduced to new things. What does that mean for us changing for around our ethics and doing this? But that's the idea of ethics, where we're coming from. So rationale, like why am I presenting anything about ethics in this course and just beginning this dialogue, which I can't answer in one course, but just to begin it with you is again, it's taking like a lot of you who are in the tech field that are taking this course, and even people who aren't in the tech field that are in others is taking a step back and taking a look at society and technology. And part of that is ethics. So like when we're looking at the actual technology from it is like some is showing like the history and beliefs and knowledge people have around it, current views that people have that can actually be challenged, uh, looking at how technology is changing us and how we're changing technology and how does this affect the society overall. And then this also going to this realm of ethics beyond our belief of how technology is affecting ethics and how effect ethics are affecting technology. 
So how we view technology progress and convenience and how we evaluate functionality is inseparably tied to us. So personally, professionally, culturally, and as members of society. And these ethics playing a role. So when we're working with technology and not viewing it as this neutral tool, is that we as the creators, if we're going with a social constructivist this kind of view of this technology of creating it, are we have our ethics that we're in following it, and those are guiding something into our actual designs. And this technology is affecting other people. And what does that have an effect on ethical choices or conflicts between everything and ourselves? and the connection of the tools that we make that then change society and society changes those tools. And also as things shift, even in the technology view, as we take this impact of the social on technology and people are creating this, that there is more of a shift nowadays of instead of just viewing ourselves separately is that the technology and tools we create and even this business has an impact on society. And so I'm presenting this one video here is from a different technologist. It's a short one, but just talking, like listen to his views and what he's saying that's guiding some views of people's views of technology, of not just the creator or the user, but what impact does this have on society? It's not the only thing that's out there. There can be counterpoints to this as well. I just want to present this as one beginning argument. We're already starting to see the signs that trust in tech is eroding very quickly. The average citizen is starting to feel more and more like, I'm not sure that I feel good about all the ways that technology is interacting with my life. Technology is already reshaping things in a way where the laws become obsolete. And certainly the tech leaders realize now that if you're the CEO of a major tech company, you are a political figure whether you choose to be or not. That of course seems to be part of the impulse behind why Mark Zuckerberg is out there campaigning. What it means is he's got to be thinking about what the political impact of Facebook is on the world and what it means to be in his position. And that's good. We want to encourage people to be thinking about you know, their role in society and their role in how governance and law evolve. We're just starting to see the first efforts to put a set of frameworks or checklists around technology so we can evaluate them. You're seeing this sort of consumer report style model where people are saying this is everything from the environmental impact of the servers that run this service to the human rights aspects of whether this company discloses information to governments or protects people's privacy and security. Is my information secure? What's their track record on keeping my passwords private and not getting hacked? We need to bring that same model, that same mindset into when we evaluate technology. It's like if I buy this and I use it every day and I put all my personal data and information into it, is that going to result in something that makes me feel better about myself and it's going to make me feel good about my place in the world and it's going to make me feel secure going forward about the way my private information is used. Everybody loves technology and if we're going to be the industry that everybody pats on the back and rewards then we've got an obligation society to be worthy of all that praise. We're already starting So again I presented that first video so you can see the example like one is realize that middle ground even the way he talks of like that you can hear some of the technological determinism in the way he talks and the social construction and not this hard technological determinism that is this middle ground that technology does have an effect on society and now people the social groups are their opinions and their interpretive flexibility around artifacts is changing so even technology and so what's being required from right here so even those impacts of what's coming from the app is the again the environmental impact of the server where this is actually running being important what people want to know about their adoption of it which changes things as well which is that social construction of technology side and you can see both of those blending and even right now is that social impact of stuff comes in but now ethics being part of that actual role of like well why was the environment something people saw in that right to take care of responsibility of taking care of the planet that we're on and they want to see that within the products that they actually use as well and that China changing the technology and that we know the technology changes and having this impact but the social groups then changing on the views of what is done like even reports and analysis of apps that they take into account for why am I going to actually use this product itself and why we're stepping into ethics being part of this course of 
your ethics and how that plays a role in design and also in the, the design of things that were impacted by ethical choices and how does that impact other people and having that kind of dialogue. So I want to take another step back as another video at this time and present to you like the ethics in the age of technology and just even where this individual argues a little bit of like well how are we learning ethics like how do we learn ethics and what's impacting our own ethics as part of it where we come to the standpoint and how technology is playing a role in that So in his wisdom, Stefan thought there wouldn't be any tension between somebody who was brought up in Mexico and Germany today. <laughs> but anyway, we'll get on to that later. Um, normally I talk about science, and today I'm going to talk about ethics. And the reason I'm going to talk about ethics is because there's been a lot of distraction from science by people who are certain that they know the answer. And part of it is promoted by ourselves, because when we take a new job, we get this great big book that just drops on our desk, and it's the ethics manual. And the ethics manual tells you this is right, and this is wrong, and it's pretty black and white. And it's one of the most boring documents ever written by a human being. Right? I mean, if you don't know this stuff by the time you take that job, you shouldn't be in that job. Because it's telling you stuff you already know. And I guess the question that I want to address today, and particularly in today's climate, which is slightly polarized, is who's teaching us what it is to be ethical? So I'd like you to take about 10 seconds in your own minds and just think through who taught you right from wrong? All right, now that you've got the answer in your minds, here's some of the answers that sometimes you get. So you have a holy book that tells you the stuff, and mama teaches you, and the preacher teaches you, and the teacher teaches you, and the lawyer teaches you, and the doctor, and of course the government, and a whole bunch of other people, your peers, and Facebook, and Twitter, and all kinds of good ways of learning right from wrong. Well, let's take a little journey to this little building. So this is the downtown market in Charleston, South Carolina. Wonderful handicrafts, wonderful food. Do you know why the steps of this building were shaped in this, in this way? They were built to exhibit the merchandise. That's where they sold people. And on this particular day, they were selling 94 prime healthy Negroes, 39 men, 15 boys, 24 women, 16 girls. What the hell was wrong with these people? Why didn't they understand right from wrong? Didn't they get the ethics manual? Well, let's go through the sources that we just talked about. So the first one was the holy book. And there's a couple of passages in the holy book that might have justified and promoted and allowed slavery. How about Mama? Well, the best-selling book was Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Mama was writing all about plantation life in South Carolina. And what Mama was teaching wasn't exactly that we should be freeing the slaves. So then you'd go to church on Sunday, and the lead preacher, the Billy Graham of his time, was Richard Furman. And he was arguing that the holding of slaves is justified by the doctrine and example contained in the Holy Writ, and is completely consistent with Christian uprightness. Because of course he was picking up the Bible and reading selective passages from the Bible. 
And by the way, if you want to know more about this, you can go to Furman University and pray in Furman Chapel. Fortunately then, they got a really smart guy. So this is an Oxford Don, chemistry professor, philosopher, radical, and an abolitionist. Until he got to be president of the University of South Carolina, at which point he wrote the 1826 pamphlets outlining the belief that slave labor is an economic necessity and the white race is superior. So here's an abolitionist who lands there and changes his mind. Cooper Library was dedicated in 1976. A doctor, well, a doctor examines bodies. A doctor should know that we're all the same, which takes us to J. Marion Sims, the founder of gynecology, who thought, there's no need for surgical anesthesia for blacks or Irish, they feel no pain. And he bought slaves to experiment on. And you guessed it, there's a statue in downtown Charleston to J. Marion Sins, and until a few months ago, you could jog by his statue in Central Park. This was not an obscure doctor. Constitution, all men are created equal. DC slavery code, nope. Here's the way we keep slaves. Why didn't these people know? Well, then comes the question, who exactly was supposed to teach them? If you are Peter Jr. and you go to church and you go to school and you read the laws and mama and papa and the holy book and everybody else is telling you this is okay, who exactly is supposed to teach you ethics? And this is actually very personal to me because see, not that long ago, this was fun and this was not. And I grew up in Mexico at a Jesuit school going to church at 7 a.m. every morning for an hour of mass in Latin. And guess what? The holy book and the preacher and the teacher and mama and papa and the laws and everybody else told me being gay was a sin. It was criminal behavior. That wasn't that long ago. I mean, I know I'm old, but that wasn't that long ago. And if Twitter and Facebook and Google and all these things had existed when I was in high school, I don't think that I would like the posts that I would have put up then. And I don't think you'd appreciate the posts that I would have put up then. So when we go and we judge our ancestors, and we go and say, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so with a great deal of self-righteousness, we have to consider partially where did they live, what were they taught, and should the ethical judgment of our peers be different than that of our ancestors? Do we apply the same standards to somebody who discriminates today than to somebody who was taught something different 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago? Do we put any context on it? Are there degrees of awful within an awful system? I'm not advocating slavery. I'm not advocating bigotry. I'm not advocating any kind of discrimination against LGBT. I'm trying to put a context on something that I lived through that I'm very sorry I lived through. That in retrospect, I know I was absolutely wrong. And this is an argument for a word that doesn't exist very much today in this very polarized left-right world. Because this side knows it's right, and this side knows it's right, and you just don't have a lot of meeting in the middle. And what we're doing is we're going through this culture war during a time when technology is changing stuff very quickly. It's changing who we speak to, it's changing who we talk to, it's changing what we can do. And in that context, ethics doesn't become black and white, it becomes Fifty Shades of Grey. So pick a random title. 
I don't think we understand how fast and how radically technology is changing us. See, the fundamental act of evolution is sex. No sex, no evolution. And we take it for granted that we have been redesigning sex. So how do we think about this? Well, bring back grandpa and grandma and let's have a birds and the bees talk with them. Okay? But instead of bringing them back as nice white-haired folks, we're gonna take a time machine, we're gonna bring them back as hormone-filled 18-year-olds. So you now have your four grandparents sitting in front of you and you're talking to them about sex. Hmm, that's an interesting conversation. Point number one. You can now have sex and not have a baby. Do you understand how weird that would be two generations ago? Because every animal in every human generation normally sex equal conception. And now you're telling them, oh no, we can have free sex and never conceive. And then you go into this stuff and you say, oh, by the way, I'm going through cancer treatments, so I'm going to conceive a child in vitro. Oh, really? Well, tell me what that is. Well, you see, you take an egg and you take a sperm and you mix them together in a petri dish and you conceive a child. Huh. Okay, we, we heard about that. I heard about that in grammar school. That was called the Immaculate Conception. <laughs> and by the way, that used to be a miracle, kids. So you're now telling me you're performing millions of miracles every year. Uh-huh. And then we've got this surrogate mother thing. So we can freeze eggs, we can have a surrogate mother. We can have identical twins born 50 years apart. Oh, of course you can. So we've decoupled sex from conception, we've decoupled sex from physical contact, and we've decoupled sex from time in two generations. Now let's come back to the ethics. Had we polled society, should you do this two generations ago, they would have said, hell no. And they would have taught never do this. So how do we establish the ethics for the next generations as technology changes what you can do? Is it a complete coincidence that the first areas to become abolitionist were the first areas to industrialize? I'll bring a thousand horsepower, you bring a hundred slaves, we'll have a free market and see who wins. Technology has a lot to do with changing the future. And as we sit here today, now try the same thought experiment. Have your grandkids, age 60, bring you back and tell you about sex. Do you think sex and conception and reproduction is going to look the same two generations from now? How do we establish an ethical conversation on that? How do we decide what should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed? Do we need a certain humility to judge the past and to establish the rules for the future. Because they may be doing things that we might find really strange. And just as the last series of points, it may be that we are doing things today that will seem pretty darn unethical to our kids because technology changes the boundaries of what is allowable. Technology sometimes drives very different ethical mores. I really want your feedback on this because this is the beginning of a book that I'm writing and I think there's a series of things we are doing that are going to change radically. Let me give you one example. Lab Grown Hamburger, 2013, $380,000. Not a lot of people buying Lab Grown Hamburgers. Lab Grown Hamburger, 2015, 20 bucks. Lab grown hamburger, another five years. Same price or cheaper than growing an animal for three years, feeding it, slaughtering it, using all that water, putting up all the greenhouse gases, treating the animal very poorly. When you have an alternative and you don't have to go vegetarian and you can still eat meat, in one generation, how do you think people are going to treat a picture like this? When there are clear alternatives that are by technology, so we don't have to do this, how do you think they're going to judge us? 
And there's a whole series of other examples of things that we might be doing today that technology is going to displace the ethics and move the ethical goalposts. And it's important to understand that both in how we judge people in the past, not justify it. I'm not justifying slavery. I'm not defending slavery. I'm not defending discrimination against gays. I'm not defending any of this stuff. But we are going to be judged. And there's far more of a record of how we're going to be judged because we've all been covered by electronic tattoos that aren't going to disappear. Whether you call it Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever else, people are going to be able to look in detail at who we were, at what we were, at what we thought. So let's teach a little bit of generation, a little bit of ethical humility, both to our own generation and to the next generation, as this collision between ethics and technology takes place. Let's be a little less self-righteous, a little more generous, and a little bit less judgmental towards the past and hope the next generations are less judgmental towards us. Establishing civility in conversations is going to be really important. Understanding where the other person is coming from, what they were taught, is really important. Helping bridge towards what we discover is the right arc of history, which I think we're on. I think this is the best time to be alive despite all the stuff that's going on there. But we need patience, we need humility, we need to reach out, and we need to build bridges. Thank you very much. So I hope you found that as an interesting video. I appreciate it when I came across it. And also this discussion of why this is important. And also how people, like, how did you learn? And you're going back to the beginning of this course when I presented that, like, data, information, knowledge, wisdom kind of model of how are we learning? Where do we come from? Because bringing that model into here is, well, how did you get to your point today with the ethics that you follow? And where, where will that change in the future? Uh, bringing into the fact of technology itself playing as an artifact that's changing it, that kind of soft technological deterministic view that the technology is changing us with society, playing a role in changing our actual ethics, bringing in new things we never actually had to deal with before, changing who we talk to and how we learn. And then also then with these groups themselves and going then to that kind of softer social construction of technology view of these different social groups having their interpretations like their interpretive flexibility around an actual artifact and those discussions of what gets adopted to not and where we're going today and when this plays a role even for ethics. And I thought that video was a perfect point of saying how technology is playing a role in that, but just even us today and questioning us of the different generations of where you sit now to where you could be and how things could change and reevaluating ourselves all the time of like, what did I think that I think was ethical and maybe realize that like what works, what doesn't, and how can I change and continuously always grow because it's a never ending actual process. So even when looking at this video, like, like that's what I say, like, do you see the, the technology terms and social construction technology in the way he talks? And like, what are your thoughts on this? So what I want to go into next is just, I'm going to call, uh, maybe not be the most interesting, I'll pre pre warn you that I'm just going through this and it may not be the most interesting, but giving kind of five ethical lenses to kind of view this. So of ethical decision making. And I'm pulling this from a different source. You can see the link at the bottom of the slide there where there's a lot of other resources and case studies and stuff around this. But what I'm presenting here is again, it's not easy to say how are people looking at things and where do you learn from your actual ethics? And you can go into an entire ethics course of where people try to understand with the different viewpoints what people take. And what I want to present here is just different five uh, ethical lenses you can look through. So if you're filtering and looking at stuff from different standpoints, here's five talking points that if you're trying to go through decisions in your own ethics, maybe you could take a look at a few of these and see what the impact. And I'm never going to argue that one of these is better than the actual other. I'm just presenting five. They're just questions and extra data that you can take into an account when thinking about stuff. And I will be presenting this with a few examples of how does this tie into, say, technology, direct electronic technology in this case. 
So if our ethical decision making is not solely based on feelings, religion, law, accepted social practices or science, then on what basis can we decide between right and wrong, good and bad? Uh, many philosophers, uh, ethicists, ugh, people who study ethics and theologians have helped us answer this critical question and they have suggested a variety of different lenses that can help us perceive ethical sin. So this is why wider range you can go beyond this course to build and learn and look into ethics and other viewpoints. But a beginning point of different things you want to look at for lens points that may fit to different situations and at least bring up questions that you can start gathering data to maybe make an answer for yourself. And so I'm just presenting these five of the rights lens, the justice lens, the utilitarian lens, the common good lens, and the virtue lens. So the rights lens, what is it? Uh, this ethical lens focuses on moral rules, rights, principles, and duties. It tends to be more u uh, universalist than other kinds of ethical theories. That is, the rules slash principles are usually intended to apply to the majority or all possible cases. So from right here. So these one rules of overall trying to fit, which can cause some issues. So what is a right? Uh, in my definition of presenting here with what is the right lens is a right is a justified claim on others. For example, if I have a right to freedom, then I have a justified claim to be left alone by others. Turned around, I can say that others have a duty or a responsibility to leave me alone. Uh, if I have a right to be to an education, then I have a justified claim to be provided with an education by society. Now with the rights lens, some suggest that the ethical action is the one that best protects and respects the moral rights of those affected. This approach starts from the belief that humans have a dignity based on their human nature per se or on their ability to choose freely what they do with their lives. On the basis of such dignity, they have a right to be treated as ends in themselves and not merely as means to others' ends. So being that, like, my values matter here, not just to validate yours. And you can see, like, this is where there's not going to be an easy answer coming from this because one person's rights they believe could impinge on others. And so what gets accepted to being what right now, what could actually change? But this is one view of taking a look at stuff. But what are the rights that play a role? So a list of moral rights include the rights to make one's own choices about what kind of life to lead, to be told the truth, not to be injured, to a, uh, to a degree of privacy, and so on, is widely debated. Some argue that non-humans have rights too. Uh, rights are also often understood as implied duties, in particular the duty to respect others' rights and dignity. And so this is where some people would say what well, I have the right to, but knowing that if I have a right, I also have a responsibility that plays a role within this and these kind of counterpoints. So the ethical issues and concerns frequently highlighted by looking through these ethical lens include, but are not limited to things like autonomy, the extent to which people can freely choose for themselves, dignity, the extent to which people are valued in themselves, not as objects with a price and transparency. So honest, open and informed conditions of social treatment and distri distribution. Now, an examples of rights related ethical issues in a tech practice. Let's take the case of a virtual banking assistant. So in what way does a virtual banking assistant that is deliberately designed to deceive users, for example, by actively representing themselves as a human, violate a moral rule or principle such as the imperative to never treat a person as a mere means to an end? So again, this is being that you have contacted something online through some other sources and is being presented as a real human, but they're not. But you think that they are as part of that. Would people be justified in feeling wronged by the bank upon discovering the deceit, even if they had not been financially harmed by the software? Does a participant in a commercial financial transaction have a moral right not to be lied to, even if a legal loophole means there is no legal right violated here? So like that, that's a talking point to think about. Now, Looking through the rights lens means anticipating the context of which violations of autonomy, dignity, or trust might show up, regardless of whether there was malign intent or whether material harms were done to people's interests. 
Many violations of such duties in the tech sector can be avoided by seeking meaningful and ongoing consent from those who are likely to be impacted, not necessarily just the end user, and offering through transparency about the design terms and intentions of the technology. However, it is important to remember that concerns about rights often need to be balanced with other kinds of concerns. For example, autonomy is not an unconditional good. Technologists should not empower users to do anything they want at all times. There are certain cases you can see this won't work. Uh, when users' autonomy poses unacceptable moral risks, this value needs to be balanced with appropriately limited moral uh, paternalism, which is also unethical in excess. An excellent example of this is the increasingly standard design required for strong passwords. And so that balance between, uh, well, letting a user put in whatever password, but then ineffective weak passwords can open up securities that then violate rights for other people when people break through with it. And so then having to have strong standards designs, but that level where that paternalism of looking over this could go too far with that design of those passwords as well. Maybe a small thing, but this is just one example. So rights related questions for technologists that illuminate the ethical landscape are things like what rights of others and duties to others must we respect in a particular context? How might the dignity and autonomy of each stakeholder be impacted by this project? Does our project treat people in ways that are transparent to which they would consent? Are our choices slash conduct of the sort that I slash we could find universally acceptable? Does this project involve any conflicting moral duties to others or conflicting stakeholder rights? If so, how can we prioritize these? Uh, which moral rights such duties involved in this project may be justifiably overridden by higher ethical duties or more fundamental rights? Okay, step, step to another lens. So again, that's one lens to look through. Doesn't answer all questions, but it's a beginning point of looking at that rights and how they could impinge. But then looking at the other one, the justice lens. And this widely used ethical lens focuses on giving individuals or groups their due. This includes the appropriate distribution of benefits and the burdens taken into consideration ethically relevant distinctions amongst people, what is known as distributive justice. So we can see here from the rights lens is looking individually within a person from right here and starting with the justice lens is bringing the ideas groups and the different groups and interactions. So in this case, justice is the idea that each person should be given their due and what people are due is often interpreted as fair or equal treatment. Equal treatment implies that people should be treated as equals according to some uh, defensible standards such as merit or need, but not necessarily that everyone should be treated in the exact same way in every respect. And so this is starting being where people get this lens from right here and arguing, that sounds weird here for the groups, but that some people may need more than others. And it's not just this equal across from right here, that some people can handle more than others versus others. And what do we distribute between here and from those actual rights? So there are different types of justice that address what people are doing in various contexts. So examples, social justice, so structural and the basic institutions of society, corrective justice, so repairing past injustice, uh, retributive justice, so determining how to appropriately punish wrongdoers and if that needs to actually be done. Uh, restorative or transformative justice, so restoring relationships or transforming social structures as an alternative to criminal punishment. And the ethical issues and concerns frequently highlighted by looking through the ethical, uh, this ethical lens include, but are not limited to, equality, uh, equity and fairness, so a morally justifiable distribution of benefits, goods, harms, and risks, diversity and inclusion, so ensuring that all impacted stakeholders, particularly those in vulnerable or marginalized groups, are actively participants in the process of determining the rights distribution, due process, so establishing procedures and conditions most likely to lead to just results, university universality slash consistency, so holding all persons and actions to the same moral standards, and power and opportunity, so recognizing that not all parties are similarly situated, acknowledging historical and systematic injustices as a background condition. So taking a step into a tech example of like this lens, um, how does a digital advertising app that allows people to place custom housing or job ads that target only people under 40 or only people in specialized zip codes impact fairness and justice? 
Like, like how, how does that when people may not even have the opportunity that they don't even know about these because they haven't had those targeted? That for one side as a corporation that may be the target of the people they want, but they're disenfranchising another group that then doesn't even get to see access to this set of information. And how does that impact two people in the same room who are then presented with different things and different accesses to it? Uh, how does design impact the accessibility of various products for people with disabilities or for people who can only afford older, cheaper technology and tools? And so people say, you should pay for it, you should get the new, but does that matter? Not everyone can afford that and have access to it, and that privilege is one group versus the other, and what can this mean? How should financial rec uh, uh, recognition tools Sorry, ugh, not financial. How should facial recognition tools, just like my eyes not re like recognizing the correct words. So how should facial recognition tools or other algorithm tools that are typically trained on unrepresentative data sets and are therefore far less accurate for some people and groups than others be used, if at all, and in which context, if any? And how does this actually have an impact? Looking through this lens enables us to see that technologies often distribute benefits and harms unevenly and frequently exasperate or perpetuate pre-existing unfair social conditions. Uh, it also stresses the need for technologists to consult stakeholders who may have very different, differently situated from themselves in order to truly understand rather than assume the potential benefits of a product as well as to be made aware of harms they might have otherwise missed. So questions that illuminate this is things like what are both the benefits and burdens created by this design slash project? And how are they distributed among various stakeholders? Uh, what are the ethical relevant uh, differences among potential users? How should we adjust for those? Have relevant stakeholders been consulted so that their views inform the project? Are those stakeholders most likely to be impacted by the project included as active participants and leaders in the design development process? Have multiple opinions been considered to serve individuals and groups with different needs? Do the risks of harm from this project fall disproportionately on the least well-off or the least powerful in society? Will the benefits of this project go disproportionately to those who already enjoy more than their share of social advantages and privileges? So it's the justice lens. And then stepping now into the next one, the utilitarian. Now, I will acknowledge so far this has been 52 minutes for this video. Uh, and this is meant to be more than just one lecture. This is a week or more or multiple lectures within one video. So at this time, you should acknowledge yourself that you may have been sitting here for 52 minutes or others if you've paused and gone and done other things and take time for yourself. Like maybe pause, get up, walk, go somewhere else, do something else for a little bit and then come back. Because I don't intend this one video to be one lecture. This is just me making one video to cover one topic so far so that with one set of slides there is one video that goes along with it so take some time to yourself right now check in on yourself check in on others make sure that you're doing okay pause and then come back to this so instead of being the utilitarian for the entire groups or take an effect of how this has impacted yourself and take a break for a little bit and come back or continue on and later in the week with the rest of this lecture if you need but i will continue because I want to make one video out of this whole thing. So the utilitarian lens. Some people who study ethics begin by asking, how will this action impact, how, how will this action impact everyone that's affected by it? Emphasizing consequences of our actions on a larger group from the individual to the actual group. So that right lens of the individual rights to the rights of the actual group and the justice is between them to the utilitarian of how do my actions impact the group? So utilitarianism, and not just going purely utilitarianism for everything you do with ethics, but one thing of how could my actions impact the group? And myself as a teacher, I try to take this into account and accept when I've done good and especially try to learn from where I've done bad. So with utilitarianism, a result-based approach says that the ethical action is the one that produces the greatest balance of good over harm for as many stakeholders as possible. 
and why sometimes just taking a pure utilitarian could disenfranchise other groups and come into the way with the rights lens and the justice lens. But one thing is if you're going purely utilitarian, it's from how does this balance for the good of harm for many stakeholders as part of this. But really taking a look at my actions, my ethics, how is this going to impact the wider group and what can I do to mitigate that as part of it. It requires an accurate determination of the likelihood of a particular result and its impact. Uh, for example, the ethical corporate action then is the one that produces the greatest good and does the least harm for all who are affected. So customers, employees, shareholders, the community, and the environment. And cost slash benefit analysis is another consequence, uh, consequentialist approach. So again, the question of what is good and bad from a company, that can be completely different when combined with that rights lens to others. But from a utilitarian lens and taking that from one side, how could this benefit? Because if you're hitting a situation that's a no-win for everything, how can you try to mitigate it as much? So the ethical issues and concerns frequently highlighted by looking through this lens include, we're not limited to, things like happiness. So in a comprehensive sense, including such factors as physical, mental, and many other forms of well-being. Uh, balancing of stakeholder interests, who is benefiting and who is being harmed, in what ways and to what degree and how many. Uh, prediction of consequences, so some consequences can be predicted and others cannot, so still one should account for all reasonably uh, foreseeable effects. So looking at that happiness, balancing stakeholder interest, prediction of the actual consequences and what will happen within the actual group. And I try to deal with this in my courses and why I'm trying to make these videos. And I'm not saying it's always perfect because I have my limited lens of what I can handle for this one course versus everything else in my own life and things to balance. But I try to take this into account when making my choices. What do I do within the actual course? I hope it'll work for most people, but I'll just keep learning each time I teach the course and every time I make new material. So example utility ethical lens in tech is that when technologists designed the first wave of apps to be uh, maximally sticky, so keeping people using it continuously, uh, so to keep users coming back to their apps or devices, most did not anticipate doing their users moral harm. They were just, this is a product, I want to get more people involved and this can be good, so getting them coming back and enticing them can be good. But now most technologists have had to abandon this level of ethical naivety uh, about issues like technology addiction that comes out. So while rights and fairness issues are also in play here, since addiction uh, comprises people's cognitive autonomy, uh, even a utilitarian reading tells us we want uh, us we went wrong, since many of the harmful consequences of sticky design were in fact foreseeable of keeping people coming back, keeping them addicted to what you had as an actual project. So technologists falsely assume that people's technological choices were reliably correlated with their increasing happiness and welfare. So they're making these choices because it makes me happy and that happiness makes me better and that's good in every single possible case. I hope you hear the sarcasm in my voice. Uh, this was not a reasonable assumption because people make themselves unhappy with their choices all the time. And we are subject to any number of mental compulsions that drive us to choose actions that promise happiness but will not deliver or will deliver only a very short-term, shallow pleasure while depriving us of a more lasting, substantive kind. Leading uh, device manufacturers now increasingly admit this by building tools to fight tech addiction. So things are changing. And also you can see some of the social construction of technology playing a role and technological determinism. Still, technology had this effect, people becoming addicting, people realize this, and then things put into place to kind of change this out of here in the social groups and that evolving that comes from right here. We don't always know where we were, where we could be, just like we saw in that earlier video about the past history and how would we judge our, how will our descendants judge us now? So questions that give a line to this are like, who are all the people who are likely to be directly or indirectly affected by this approach in, and in what ways? Will the effects in um, aggregate likely create more good than harm? And what types of good and harm? Uh, what are we counting as well-being and what are we counting as harm slash suffering? What are the most morally significant harms and benefits that this project involves? Is our view of these concepts too narrow, or are we thinking about all relevant types of harm slash benefit, so psychological, political, environmental, moral, cognitive, emotional, institutional, cultural, and etc.? How might future generations be affected by this project? 
Have we adequately considered due use and downstream effects other than those we intend? Have we considered the full range of actions, such resources, such opportunities available to us that might boost this project's potential benefits and minimize its risks? Are we setting too easily of an ethically acceptable design or goal to do harm, or are we or are there missed opportunities to set a higher ethical standard and generate even greater benefits? Okay. So next, stepping into the common good lens. So like we've seen so far the rights lens of the individuals and how that impacts other individuals from right here, that's justice lens of the actual group, the utilitarian lens that we just ended off with here of saying our impacts, our choices on the larger groups we have here. And now coming into the common good lens is according to the common good approach, life and community is a good in itself and our actions should continue to contribute that, that the society and this group of being together is already good and we should try to keep our actions to keep that society as part of that as good. And that changes things from different societies and groups when people hold and who differentiates it and why a purely common good could be an issue. So this approach suggests that the interlocking relationships of society are the basis of ethical reasoning and that respect and compassion for all others, especially the vulnerable, are requirements of such reasoning. So between us, not just myself, not just the larger group overall, and that we have these different groups, but there could be different disenfranchised groups, and what could that mean? This approach also calls attention to common conditions that are important to the welfare of everyone, such as clean air and water, a system of laws, effective police and fire departments, health care, a public education system, or even public recreational areas. Unlike the utilitarian lens, which sums up and aggregates goods for every individual, the common good lens highlights mutual concerns for the shared interests of all members of the actual community. From right here, that there could be things that are balancing and different between the different groups. So things uh, like, again, ethical issues and concerns frequently highlighted by looking through the common good lens is things like communities. So uh, varying scales ranging from families to neighborhoods, towns, provinces, nations, worlds, departments, degrees, whatever, relationships, not only among individuals, but also relationships in more holistic sense of groups, including non-humans, animals, and the nature world as well, institutions of governance, and the ways in which these networks, institutions interact with each other, economic institutions, including corporations, corporate culture, trade, organizing, etc., and other social institutions, such as religious groups, alumni associations, professional. And so you can see it's between these different groups and people that are part of it. So going back to a tech example, if we take our original one that we have from utilitarianism, um, we noted, uh, like with our discussion of technological addiction, we noted its impacts on individual happiness and well-being. However, we also know that technology addiction can harm the common good through damaging family and civil ties, institutions that are essential for healthy communities, for example, democratic institutions. So there may be the individual right to be left alone, people have the right to go off this case, but even if we take in the idea of games, in this case of how addicted people can come, is you can go addiction, but it can go to a level where it breaks down society and then what happens in between these groups, and it's not separate from it. So technology use, data storage, and energy intensive training of AI models also impact the environment in ways that impact the common good. Um, and so does using these AI models in this training outweigh the negative impacts of this? And can it be beneficial? From right here is something that comes up in the common good lens and can come to question. And so in addition, with everything from weapons to pacemakers now being connected to the internet, cybersecurity has become one of the conditions required for the common good. So that companies, institutions need to have things in practices which may impede upon other people's rights, but impedes upon the common good of security of what's built into this. And so even if you are using these devices or you're designing them, are you taking into account the security that's related around it? So again, questions that illuminate this landscape is, does this project benefit many individuals, but only at the expense of the common good? Does it do the opposite by sacrificing the welfare or key interests of individuals for the common good? Have we considered these trade-offs and determining which are ethically justifiable? What might this technology do for or to social institutions such as various levels of government, schools, hospitals, churches, infrastructure, and so on? And what might this technology do for or to the larger environment 
beyond human society, such as ecosystem, biodiversity, sustainability, climate change, animal welfare, etc. Ooh, moving forwards, we are an hour into this, and we're not, not too far off. We're on to the last one that I want to present, which is the virtue lens right here. So a very ancient approach to ethical ethics argues that ethical actions ought to be consistent with certain ideal virtues that provide for the full development of our humanity. And this is open-ended what those virtues actually are, but it is a lens that some people look through. So these vir virtues are dispositions and habits that enable us to act according to the highest potential of our character and on behalf of the values like truth and beauty, honesty, courage, compassion, generosity, tolerance, love, fidelity, integrity, fairness, self-control, and prudence are all examples of these actual said virtues. Um, and goes beyond what people view from here. So virtue ethics asks of any action, what kind of person will I become if I do this? Or is this action consistent with my, uh, with my acting at my best? So ethical issues, again, that have come out of this is things like habits of character, such as virtue or vice, the features of a person's character, context, the particular context in which decisions about technology developments are made, as well as the context in which the technology will be developed. Expression of already existing virtues and vices, so technology products, will express virtues and vices that already exist in creators and users of technology, and cultivation of new technologies and vices, so technological products may cultivate or reinforce virtues or vices in their actual users themselves. So an example of virtual related ethics issues and tech practices is that many websites have given people access to news sources that are subsidized only by online advertising elevated to mass visibility by popularity and page views and vulnerability to being gamed by armies of bots, trolls, and foreign adversaries. So has such access helped to make us wiser, more honest, more compassionate, and more reasonable citizens? Or did it have very different effects on our intellectual and civic virtues? Like combining this back to that DIKY model, data information knowledge, is that if things are being filtered to you in a certain way by other algorithms, how does that influence what you see as right or wrong or those actual ethics are from learning? If we saw those videos here. And so what has come from Virtuous? If that you are making or using this, what happens from this? How do we question it? There's probably no better conceptual lens than virtue ethics for illuminating the problematic effects of attention economy and digital media. Uh, it helps to explain why we have seen so many pernicious moral effects of this situation, even through the individual acts of social media companies uh, like appeared morally benign with what they're doing. No individual person was wronged by having access to news articles on various social media platforms, and even the individual consequences didn't seem so destructive initially. What has happened, however, is that our habits have been gradually altered by this new media practices not designed to sustain the same civic function. Not all technological changes must degrade our virtues, of course. So things like consider the ethical prospects of virtual reality technology, which are still quite open as VR environments become an augmented reality in this mix here, commonplace and easy to access. Might people develop stronger virtues of empathy, civic care civic and care and moral perspective by experiencing other circumstances in a more immersive realistic way is that by vr not just being games but being immersed in someone else's reality how has that changed my perspective and engaging that or will they instead become even more numb and detached walking through others lives like players in a video game uh, most important is the question what vr design choices would make the first ethically desirable outcome more likely than the second ethically undesirable one so again, questions that can illuminate this landscape of looking things through a virtue lens is what design habits are regularly embodying and are they the habits of excellent designers? Would we want future generations of technologists to use our practices as the example to follow? What habits of character will this design such project foster in users and other affected stakeholders? Will this design such project weaken or dis desensitize any important human habits, skills, or virtues that are central to human excellence, so moral, politically, or intellectually? Will it strengthen any? Will this design slash project incentivize any uh, 
like vicarious habits or traits in users or other stakeholders and so forth like you can see there are like uh, are our choices and practices generally embodying the appropriate mean of conduct relative to the context or are they extreme excessive or deficient in some ways is there anything unusual about the context of this project that requires us to reconsider or modify the normal script of good design practices are we qualified and in a position to safely and ethically make such modifications to moral design practices? And if not, who is? And what will this design says project say about us as people in the eyes of those who receive it? Will we, as individuals and as a team such organization, be proud to have our names associated with this project one day? Okay. So you can take a lot of time to reflect upon it. Those are just those five that's presenting as those lenses. And this is not the end all of anything and saying how we get to believe, but it's one way of looking at between the individuals of the rights-based and how our rights versus others and how this is pinned in between to the groups and disenfranchised to the overall trying to maximize it to the groups of where impact take into account. What is the common good that's beyond what we're actually doing and where is this virtuous? Is this something we even want to be? And so what I want to present next is a framework for ethical decision making. If you're not sure, it's not like any starts. We all will keep growing. But one thing of like, maybe if you want to have an algorithm to step through this and looking at these lenses when looking and evaluating situation and taking it a look at these different lenses and taking into account all these different groups. And so within this, I say first is identify the ethical issues. Could this decision or situation be damaging to someone or to some group or unevenly benefit to people? Does this decision involve a choice between a good and bad alternative, or perhaps between two goods or between two bads? And is this issue about more than solely that is legal or what is more efficient? If so, how? Get facts. It's the next thing. What are the relevant facts of these cases? What facts are not known? Can I learn more about the situation? Do I know enough to make a decision? What individuals and groups have an important stake in the outcomes? Are the concerns of some of those individuals or groups more important? Why? And what are the opinions for acting, options for acting? So not opinions, but options for acting. Have all the relevant persons or groups been consulted? Have I identified uh, creative options? Next, evaluate the options by asking the following questions. And this is kind of looking through those lenses. Like which option best respects the rights of all who have a stake, so the rights lens? Which option treats people fairly, giving them each what they are due, the justice lens? Which option will produce the most good and do the least harm for as many stakeholders as possible, the utilitarian lens? Uh, the least harm for as many stakeholders as possible, so again, the utilitarian lens. Uh, which option best serves the community as a whole, not just some members, so a common good lens? and which option leads to act as the sort of person I want to be, so the virtue lens, and which option appropriately takes into account the relationships, concerns, and feelings of all stakeholders. So it's one I didn't present, but the care ethics kind of lens. So from all of this is just asking, going through all of that and choose an option for action and test it. Uh, after evaluating between the facts and looking from these different sides and what you see from here, uh, so after evaluating using, using all of these lenses, which option best addresses the situation? If I told someone of respect or a public audience which option I have chosen, what would they say? How can my decisions be implemented with the greatest care and attention to the concerns of all stakeholders? And next, implement your decision and reflect on the outcomes. How did my decisions turn out? And what have I learned from the specific situation? What, if any, following actions should I do? So if things didn't work out from these different lens, if new things came out of this, and taking this into account that when you're building something, whatever you're doing or whatever you're using, this is having an actual overall impact. Okay, so the reading for this week is actually a video where I want you guys to watch on this again. It's from 2014, so we have a gap here. This is from now I'm recording this video again, February 27th, 2022. So this is already looking back at some of these kind of concerns around this. It was 2014. So we're looking at eight years ago from this point in time. And so looking at digital ethics and the future of humans in a connected world. And what does this mean? So another TEDx one. And so I want you to watch this video. So no reading for this week. Watch the video. 
and look at it from some things of what are the TDs within his views, what's the social constructionist kind of stuff within his views, and what are your opinions on this, and taking into account a direct thing within actual technology and talking about it. Other than that, I honestly hope in whatever stance you're at is that you're doing okay. And we all have different beliefs, we all have different ethics, but we're all learning and trying to grow together and hopefully being a little better and hopefully being able to have discussions. It's not easy around that, but I'd hope that if you find yourself in your most heated stance, that you think about, well, am I so far away from them that I can't talk anymore? And what could be done? Maybe I just need time to learn something more, different lens, talk to others, see others from that group that may not be so extreme, and maybe we'll have more of a discussion. Uh, and something that I need to keep doing myself as well constantly as I have my own issues to deal with and everyone else does, but how can we come together as a group and keep learning and growing our ethics and growing together with technology from the future and acknowledging that other things are actually happening. Okay, from there, I hope again that you're all doing good and take the time you need to take care of yourself and the other people around you and maybe we'll end up in a better world at some point in time. Even though I do think a lot of things in this world right now are good. Right now, I'm not saying that they're bad, but we can grow and we can possibly always make it better or help out other people where their worlds aren't so good. Okay, I shall stop there and you guys continue on and being the great people I know you are.